I want to welcome our friends from the Czech Republic, from California, um, for our study from Isaiah 54. 17 verses, uh, about three quarters of the ladies here today have read it in preparation. If you've not yet read it, uh, we're going to go through it today. We may be able to finish. Uh, Maybe not. <laughs> I heard Sue's like, eh, I'm not so sure. We'll see. It is an incredible chapter. So uh, I think you're about to be highly encouraged from the Word of God. Before we begin, just a, a brief word from Jan, and Sue leads us in prayer, however you all want to do it. But Jan, what a marvelous tribute to your mother for her funeral, 98 years of age. I'm going to use her as an example here in our study today, but any word? Uh, not a whole lot. I'm just so grateful to all of you for supporting me and my family through all this. And it was very, it was really helpful, I mean, to not be alone. And uh, I really appreciate you. I appreciate Matt. That funeral home is incredible. Yes. Highly recommend them. They just make you feel like everything's okay. So that's really good. We agree, and that's our personal choice for a funeral home as well. So. Yeah, so Brown Cummings, can yeah. I say that? Yeah, of course. Sean comes to our Tuesday morning yeah. Bible study. They've been around. They're the oldest funeral home <coughs> in this area. And uh, so... Very um, sensitive people. Oh, yeah. We will later in life. We can pray for the leader. Yeah, oh, yes. oh yes. my goodness. Thank you, Sue. Uh, we won't go into much detail except to say our very dear friend, Alita Smith, uh, is having surgery this morning, and very serious surgery. So we need to ask the Lord for his mercy and uh, protection for Alita and Gary. Um, Sue, before we slip out, if you'll let me know which hospital. Uh, and, okay. Uh, I'd be able to run by there. Uh, we'll see today. All right, uh, Sue, you going to lead us in prayer? Yes, yeah, if you don't mind. Gracious Heavenly Father, um, what a beautiful, cool morning. Mm. We see changes all around us. One constant, Father, is you. Mm. And we come to you today, Lord, with open hearts, open minds, and uh, we pray that we'll. Um, glean from this message um, that Wade's bringing us this morning the things that you want us to understand and make clear. Forgive us, Father, when we fail you. Be with those of our uh, number who are not here, who are traveling or ill or um, go through things that, that you know about that we may not. Forgive us, Father, when we don't come to you first on all things. Guide us through this day. In your name we pray. Thank you, Sue. Okay, <clears throat> here we go by way of review. Oh, Gene Bundy, I tried to get an AI picture of Jesus, and I learned some stuff, okay? So you can't read it, it's too small, but this is the actual chat GPT boundaries that I established, and here's what I said. Please give me a very realistic 35 millimeter photo of Jesus from Nazareth. Don't make him beautiful as a human being. Make him look physically ugly. Just as the Bible says, natty hair, brown eyes, an unkempt beard, paint on his face and in his eyes. Follow the pattern of Isaiah. He had no beauty or majesty to attract people to him. There was nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind. A man of suffering, familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces. He was despised, and we held him in low esteem. I used Isaiah 53. Those were the words. So it spun, spun, spun. It's usually very fast. And it came back and says, I cannot generate... An exact image of religious figures such as Jesus based on religious depictions or any specific sacred text, especially if the request is deeply tied to sacred interpretations. 
Instead, I can create a representation inspired by your description, one that focuses on a humble, rugged figure capturing human vulnerability and suffering. Would you like me to proceed with an image along these lines while ensuring it is respectful and reflective of the description from Isaiah? Yes. Spin, spin, spin. I wasn't able to generate the image because, on and on, would you like me to proceed on, based on a, a respectful, thoughtful approach to your historical reference? Yes. Spin, 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 <laughs> spin, spin. It seems I still cannot generate this image. Because it conflicts with their content policy. Then, no, Rochelle, you're, you're spot on. No, you no, you're spot on. So what's the content policy that okay. allows that? Okay. I didn't hear Bill's that. right. Bill just said the computer can only spit out what it's fed. Right. So the content policy is the bias of the humans behind AI who are and that's what I've been doing, trying to give a conservative bias. Okay, well, so what they're saying is, we're, we're, we're not going to give you a depiction of Jesus based on Scripture. It violates our content policy. Because they're saying it's based on a particular interpretation of Isaiah 53. Okay, I get it. But you know why they're doing this. It's not Jesus. It's Muhammad. Because if you, yeah, remember, uh, uh, what's his name, Rushdie? Salman Rushdie made an image of uh, Muhammad, which is forbidden in Islam, and they've sought to kill him. And so what they've said is, we're not going to do religious depictions. But it goes beyond that, because I lost my, uh, oh, by the way, I got a bid on that. Was that today or tomorrow? Yeah, it's tomorrow, right before OU kickoff. <laughs> I, I lost my wadeburleson.org site. And there are people bidding on that. I, I, I don't know why I lost it. Uh, it's through Google. So it's a domain. So you type in wadeburleson.org. I lost it. I've, been, I've had it for 15 years. Okay. So now people are bidding on that domain. And I'm like, why do they... Well, that's a great point. There's a, there's a country and western singer. I don't know who it is because they're anonymous, but now I'm having to bid on my own site. So I don't know, what, I don't know what's going on. And I don't know, if, I mean, I'm sure because Bill is so smart, he meant that metaphor to say that we can't get an image, we can't, we can't reflect an image of Jesus because it only will spit out what it's fed Are the same thing. We project an image of Jesus based oh, on the web. Excellent, excellent point. point. We are fed. I mean, it's just AI, but it's us. Yeah, no, excellent. I think. I'm, no, so they did give you an image of Jesus with the blonde hair, blue eyes, looked like Brad Pitt. Yeah. No, he was he was wearing hair. Oh, the long. One was the, oh, the, okay, yeah. But it, was it looked like a, mo a Hollywood movie star. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, it wasn't the right name of Correct. Jesus. Maybe. If I had not put the name of... Oh, good point. So maybe that's true if I had not put the name of Jesus. Yeah, Middle Eastern, whatever. But as I was trying to figure out how to get my website back up on a different domain... And I got, and it, I got, back got it back up, up on WadeBurleson.com. I noticed Google puts a warning... For anyone who comes to my site, do you remember what it said, Rochelle? Dangerous content. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. the <laughs> Bingo. If you wish to proceed, press I understand. Every single person who goes. Wow. I know. So I told Rochelle, what's, what's dangerous? <laughs> Individual thinking is dangerous. <laughs> Yes, to uh, with a flag. Yeah, I know. It's just flag. bizarre. And it, it, you had to ask, say yes. I want to send it. Yeah. To, to have certain 
Yeah. An eagle, a flag, our national emblem. I don't know, Bill. It's a crazy world, and they're attempting to censor people so that we only can say publicly what they, whoever they are, want us to say. And man, guys and gals, we better fight that tooth and tongue. Yeah, yep, I saw that. We got back back on. Yeah, that's crazy. Well, I just wonder how much longer we can stay up uh, teaching this. All right, quick, quick review. Look at this now. We're at 54. We've got one more chapter until the end of Deutero Isaiah. By the way, 54 and 55 are one long poem. They go together. It's poetry in Hebrew, and it is the response to the message of the suffering servant in Isaiah 53, how Jesus died for us. This is our response that we're about to read, our response to redemption. And then beginning in 56, going through the end of the book, 66 chapters, just remember Philip 66, Isaiah 66. You can always remember how many chapters are in Isaiah. Now, I'm going to ask you questions. Proto-Isaiah, first 39 chapters, what time period are these writings dealing with? Anybody? First? Pre-exile. Pre-exile. Excellent. Okay. So, these are words to the Jews before they go into Babylonian exile. Tough question. What year did the entire Jewish nation go into exile? What year? What, Catherine? You got it. Oh, my goodness. Good for you. 586. Now, some people might say 587 because, you know, the way you keep time with the moon and the sun. Okay, however, the best biblical chronologist that has ever lived um, was in Kansas. Um, and brilliant. And he has utterly convinced me 586 is the right time period. Doc will sometimes say 587 in his notes, but he agrees with me of the chronologist in Kansas. Um, and um, he was a Seventh-day Adventist and a brilliant biblicist. Deutero, Isaiah. Deutero in Hebrew means second. What time period do, do, do these chapters deal with? Anyone? Huh? Okay. Rochelle's telling me to wipe my nose, so. I'm like, I thought you were telling me. What time period? I thought you were saying this time period here. No. What time period does this deal with? While they're in exile. You got it. While they're during the exile. And I got a picture. Remember, these scrolls would be read, little short scrolls, would be read to the Jews while they're in captivity. Then Trito Isaiah, what time period? After. When they're back rebuilding Jerusalem and the temple. You know these dates, so we're not going to go over them. Israel as a kingdom was destroyed in 722 B.C. That's the northern kingdom. After Israel split into two kingdoms, the north was Israel, the south was Judah. Prior to the split in 931 B.C., after Solomon died, the Jews were known as Hebrews, never Jews. It's always Hebrews, which means to cross over. They, they crossed over the Red Sea to come to Canaan. That's where they got their name, Hebrews. And, and also descendants of Abir, which in Genesis, but we won't get into that. But here's the deal. The name Jew didn't come into existence until after Israel was destroyed by Assyria. Then the people of the southern kingdom of Judah became known as Jews, an abbreviation of Judah. So you know all that. For our purposes, Isaiah was born in 761 B.C. 
He was called to be a prophet when he was 21 years old in 740 B.C. Now, how do we know that? That's the year King Uzziah of Judah died. Isaiah 6, in the year King Uzziah died, I saw Yahweh high and lifted up. And it's that great call of Isaiah to be a prophet. But I tell you that because Israel, the northern kingdom, was still in existence when he was called to be a prophet. So some of the early writings, Hazel, of Isaiah, 1 through 39, are intended for the northern kingdom, for the Israelites to hear. And Isaiah's calling them to repent. But they didn't. And so get this now. He's 39 years old in 722 B.C. when Israel is destroyed, the northern kingdom. And so now he turns his attention to Judah, his own home country. Jerusalem's the capital of Judah. Samaria was the capital of Israel. Isaiah turns his attention to Judah, and you see this in chapters 1 through 39, and he starts saying to his brothers in Judah, to the Jews, listen, if we don't repent, the same thing's going to happen to us. And some of my favorite chapters, Sue, in the entire Bible are chapters 37, 38, and 39 of Isaiah, where we see, Rochelle, Judah repents. 701 B.C., Hezekiah falls on his face, prays to Yahweh, says, please forgive us of our idolatry. They cleansed the temple courtyard of all of the idols of Assyria, and the people put on sackcloth and ashes and repented. And Assyria, who had surrounded Jerusalem, was about to destroy the city in one night, one night after the Jews repented, 185 thousand Assyrian soldiers died suddenly and Judah was saved at 701 BC. Um, historians who write about this, not biblical historians, world historians say that the Assyrians uh, died of the bubonic plague, that rats moved through the camp. Um, the great Greek historians, Strabos and Herodotus, they write about that. But the Bible says, an angel of Yahweh went through the camp of the Assyrians with his sword and slew the soldiers. Now, when I was a kid, so I had this image of this flying cherub with a sword doing this. Okay. However, Isaiah tells us, I think it's... Uh, forget which chapter, but he tells us how they died. The Assyrians died. He says they died, Rochelle, of a pandemic. A pandemic. But here's, here's my point, and then we'll move on from this. Throughout the Bible, anytime there's a sword in the hand of a cherub, it's a picture of judgment because of sin. When Adam and Eve were cast out of the Garden of Eden, there were two cherubs with a flaming sword in the middle, guarding entrance to the garden. By the way, tabernacle in the wilderness, the temple, the Ark of the Covenant, there are two angels, cherub, over the Ark with their face toward what's called the mercy seat. And on the mercy seat, the blood of an innocent sacrifice was placed. What does that represent? Well, it represents the judgment of God has come on an innocent animal. They died. So the angel with the sword doing this to the Assyrian soldiers, it's just the Bible's way of saying they were judged by Yahweh. Are you with me? Now, when Jesus Christ died on the cross, Isaiah 53, He bore our iniquities. He bore our sins. In Him, the punishment due us for our well-being was placed. He died. The sword pierced him. The sword of Yahweh. Now watch. He's laid in the tomb. And then on the morning of resurrection, Mary comes to the tomb. John 20 says she sticks her head in to look. And what does she see? Anybody remember? Two angels on each end with 
the linen on the empty sarcophagus. Jesus has taken the sword for us, and he's risen from the dead. This is the theme throughout Scripture. Okay. So, yeah. No, go ahead. I took his class down at Edmund to this museum. Yes. Brown. Have you heard of that? Of the course. David, Kingdom of David and Solomon. Yeah. Have Beautiful. Been, have you been there? No, but I've read about it. Okay. They had like a ring of Hezekiah's lead yes. servant. Yes. An actual ring. And yeah. I don't know. It just made me think of you. And I was like, I want to go there with Lee. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we ought to take a trip in there. Uh, it's sure. traveled across the United States yeah. and it's on loan. Uh, it's definitely worth the price of admission. I think it's like ten dollars. Yeah. Yeah. Like he said, it was really. Well, and it, it may not cost anything, but it's definitely worth it. And uh, and there's other things that they have, uh, but that ring, that ring, comes from the time period when Assyria surrounded you uh, Jerusalem. You read about it, Isaiah 37, 38, 39. That was Isaiah's key servant. I mean, you're looking at at history. So here we go. This is all background. background Isaiah, Isaiah 54. You'll understand why. 586. Jerusalem is destroyed by the Babylonians. Why the Babylonians? The Babylonians defeated Assyria, the world's first empire. And and, and by the way, Hazel, this blows people's mind. Um, the Babylonians defeated Assyria at the Battle of Armageddon. True story. Har Megiddo is a place. It's a big valley. It's the breadbasket of Israel. So Nebuchadnezzar, the general of the Babylonian army, his dad, Nabopolassar, was still living. He brings his army to the plains of Megiddo. Uh, Har means hill. There's a, a fortress city, has been for years, on a hill that watches over Armageddon, the valley of Megiddo. So Nebuchadnezzar brings his army, 609 B.C., and he defeats the Assyrians. We read about it in the Bible. It's the, it's the time, um, well, I won't get into this, but for 70 years, Babylon rules the world as the world's empire. 70 years, 609 to 539. Isaiah died in 681. So Isaiah was, uh, in fact, excuse me, 686. He died exactly a hundred years before this happened on the screen, before Jerusalem was destroyed. He wasn't around. But what we're reading, Deutero Isaiah, are scrolls that were read to the Jews who'd been taken into Babylonian captivity. So Doc and I both believe that a disciple of Isaiah wrote these scrolls, these short scrolls, and Ezra, the scribe, later collated them together and put them in what you know as the book of Isaiah. But whether Isaiah wrote it himself or a disciple, it doesn't make any difference. They're words of encouragement to the Jews who are living here, beginning in 586, taken there by Nebuchadnezzar. Now, why can they not go this way? It's the Arabian desert. You will die. You can't make it. So you go always north. This is why all the enemies that ever attacked Jerusalem always came from the north. Um, Mediterranean Sea here, desert this way, north was the way to come. Egypt right here, the biggest fortress cities that Israel had was down here, highly protected from the Egyptians and Ethiopians um, and, and so on. They were called Cushites. Okay, but most of the attacks on Jerusalem throughout history came from the north. Now watch this. They go up here and then they go in the Mesopotamian Valley between the Tigris and Euphrates River and they were captive there. And as they sat outside the walls of Babylon, these scrolls, including... Isaiah 53, what we're about to read in Isaiah 54, they were read to the people for encouragement, for encouragement. 
Isaiah 53 is the suffering servant. Incredible chapter about the Lord Jesus Christ. But there are four suffering servant poems in Deutero-Isaiah. 42, 49, 50, 52. If anybody ever says to you, Jesus is not talked about in the Old Testament, just take them here. Just take them here. Oh, my goodness. You see Jesus throughout these poems. The suffering servant, the Messiah. Now, what does it mean he's the suffering servant? Well, Yahweh promises to give the suffering servant a mission to lead the nations as a light. The suffering servant is mocked, abused, attacked by the very people he is sent to help. And he endures his suffering without complaining because he's enduring it for us. And he bears for us the suffering due our sins. The suffering servant is murdered, but God returns him to life and rewards him. And so, now watch. This is hard to get a hold of. But if you forget everything else, I say, never forget this. If the suffering servant endured the punishment for your sins, you will never be punished for your sins. To punish two people for the same crime committed is the height of injustice. So you live your life already forgiven. There's no amount of prayer, commitment, promises, petitions that bring you forgiveness. Your forgiveness is in Christ. This is why I get the heebie-jeebies when evangelical preachers pound people to do things so that God will be pleased. He is already pleased. Now, as my grandpa used to say, put that in your pipe and smoke it. Okay, this really bothers people when you preach grace like that because they're like, how can we control others if we tell them God is pleased with them in Christ? How can we control them? I'm like, why are you trying to control them? Let the Spirit control them. Who is the suffering servant? It's Jesus. Everything about Jesus modeled the nation of Israel. By the way, the Jews today will tell you the suffering servant is them. They're the suffering servant, the nation of Israel. And they forbid Isaiah 53 from being read in the synagogues even today. You can't discuss it, can't talk about it. And if anybody says, oh, but Jesus is the suffering servant, they're like, no, we are as a nation. And my response to that is, oh, for heaven's sake, suffering servants don't drop megabombs on Palestinians. They're not suffering quietly. They're not the suffering servant. Jesus is. Now, here we go. We're almost done. This is why and how you will understand Isaiah 54. This is an AI representation of Babylon. Not a bad one. Much better than their picture of Jesus they wouldn't give. Um, this is an AI representation of Jerusalem. Nebuchadnezzar took Jerusalem to dust. He destroyed it. Now, it's important to understand that Jeremiah, Jeremiah was a contemporary of Ezekiel and Daniel. He was about 100 years younger than Isaiah. He was living in Jerusalem, Hazel, when Babylon destroyed the city. He was in chains. He had a block around his neck. And he was in a dungeon underneath King Zedekiah's palace. Why did they imprison Jeremiah? Because when Ezekiel, who was already in captivity, 597, 10,000 Jews were taken in 597 by Nebuchadnezzar to Babylon, Ezekiel would write these prophecies. In fact, he would act them out, Rochelle. He wouldn't speak. He would act these prophecies out. He'd, he'd build a fire. He'd put a bronze pot on it. He said, this is Jerusalem. You're about to be on fire. But he'd do it acting. And people would watch and they'd write it down. And then they'd send the message back to Jerusalem to be read. And the message was, if we don't repent, we will be crushed. That's what Ezekiel was saying to his fellow Jews. You know what the Jews did when they heard it read, Catherine? They 
They mocked Ezekiel. What are you talking about? We are God's people. We are protected and safe. He's the one in sin. He's the one in captivity. But Jeremiah would be at the back and he would speak up and say, hey, listen, Ezekiel was raised to be a priest, but God called him to be a prophet. And you better listen to his words because he is telling the truth. Who's that saying that? Jeremiah shut him up. And there were hundreds of false prophets who would say to the people, peace, peace, comfort, comfort, safety, safety. We're God's chosen people. Don't worry. He'll protect us. And Jeremiah is down in the dungeon. This is why Jesus would say a prophet is not welcome in his hometown. And the reason is when you give a message that's rough to hear. Sound familiar, Bill? Facebook, here's a message that's rough to hear. What do they do? They get rid of the messenger. Here we go. The way to understand Isaiah 54 is to understand two cities. Jerusalem in Judah. Babylon in Babylonia. Now we call it Iraq. Two cities. I'm going to say something and I'm going to give you an opportunity to respond. And then we're going to, I'm going to read the text. I'm going to read all the way through. We may come back next week and continue discussing it because it's that powerful. But when the Jews are in Jerusalem, faithful to Yahweh, worshiping Him alone, which happens in 701 B.C. When Hezekiah repents, the nation repents, they are God's faithful wife. They prosper. He is their husband. They are wed to Him. But when they start turning to the Babylonian gods and start worshiping those gods, idolatry, God removes them from Jerusalem, forsakes his unfaithful wife, and they are punished for their sins in Babylon. Let me say that again. While in Jerusalem faithful, they are God's faithful wife. He is their husband. Because of creeping idolatry, God sends His unfaithful wife to Babylon to be punished. Now, It's a great question. Because even though they were before the resurrection, are they still... That's a great question. Catherine, you're nailing what we're going to discuss today. So let me say it again. They are being punished by God. But now watch. The The great great mistake evangelical Christians make is saying God does the same thing today. And they miss the suffering servant who bore our punishment himself for us. In other words, the cross becomes our captivity. So here's the way I say it, Catherine. Every sinner will be punished. The question is, how? Either you're wed to Christ and He bore your punishment, marriage supper of the Lamb, make sense? Or you bear it yourself and God will punish you. But now listen to this. Ezekiel the prophet said, Yahweh takes no pleasure in the punishment of the wicked. Now I'm going to ask you, it's not a trick question, I'm going to ask you, what is the punishment from God 
for sin. Huh? Death. Death. And God takes no pleasure in the death of those He created in His image. But He will put sinners to death. This is why if you're in Zion, wed to Christ, redeemed, you have everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is everlasting life through Jesus, the Messiah, our Lord. So, Isaiah 54 is our response to the suffering servant who went into exile on our behalf. Now, Catherine, we come back to your question. But are the Jews truly being punished themselves? I wish Doc were here. Doc says, yes, of course they are. In fact, they're punished double for their sins. But then Doc will tell you, beginning in Isaiah 40, they are forgiven because they've been punished. They have died as a nation. They have died as a culture. They were the unfaithful wife, and now they've been punished. They've lost their temple. They lost the ark. They've lost it all. And they are punished. But this is where Bill Blom comes, Rochelle. Bill is saying, after the Babylonian captivity, when God punished His people in Babylon, from that point forward, worship in the temple was no more. There was no ark. There was no spirit. You worshiped Yahweh directly. Now, they did come back and they rebuilt the temple. And it was a... It was the national cultural center. The, the Jews worshipped in the temple, but there was no ark, there was no spirit, and this is when you have the rise of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Anytime you have religion without the Spirit of God and a focus on the Lord Jesus Christ, you have either legalism or liberalism. The Pharisees were legalists, the Sadducees were liberals. But where the Spirit of God is, there is freedom and there is truth. So, the question is, which city are you in? Jerusalem, wed to Christ, Zion, or Babylon, bearing your own sins? Doc will say, he's a universalist because he says, after people are punished in hell, they're restored because they pay for their sins. That's why he says it. I say, no, Doc, no. Everyone for whom Christ died, He will wed. And we are in Jerusalem. But people who bear their own sins will die. They'll cease to exist after the resurrection. Now, am I, could I be wrong on that? Oh, well, maybe. We'll see. But the whole point of Isaiah 54 is the righteous must live by faith. Paul takes Isaiah 54 in Galatians 3. And he compares Zion and Babylon, two mountains, the law and grace, the promise and the law. And based on Isaiah 54, the Apostle Paul says, listen, all the promises in your life, promises to be protected, promises that you are forgiven, promises of His love, promises that He will never, no, never, no, never, no, never abandon you or leave you. All those promises are in Christ, and they're yes and amen. Stop trusting your commitment to receive the promises of God. They're all by faith. Are you following me? Now, let me show you some of these promises. Here we go. Isaiah 54. Remember, this is the response to what the suffering servant has done for you. Shout for joy. O oh, barren one, you who have borne no child, break forth into joyful shouting and cry aloud, you who have not travailed. For the sons of the desolate one will be more numerous than the sons of the married woman, says Yahweh. Now what does that mean? Okay. 
You got to understand the context. Watch this now. We just went over it. This simply means the desolate one, the barren one. They're the captives in exile. The married woman, they're the faithful in Jerusalem, but they're not anymore. They used to be and they prospered, but they're gone. Now they're barren and they're childless. Remember when Babylon conquered Jerusalem, they took the children of husbands and wives and they took them to be servants to the soldiers. And so later on, some of them were united when they were adults, when they came back to Jerusalem. We read that in the scripture. But they're barren now. They have no children. But shout, you who are barren in Babylon, you who are in exile, you will have more sons than when you were married to Yahweh in Jerusalem. Now, they're hearing this and they're like, how can that be? We're captives. Well, it can be because of Isaiah 53, the suffering servant. Look at verse 2. Enlarge the place of your tent. Stretch out the curtains of your dwelling. Spare not. Lengthen your cords. Strengthen your pegs. For you will spread abroad to the right and to the left, and your descendants will possess nations and will resettle the desolate cities. This is a promise now. This is a promise that they're about to be rescued by Yahweh's Messiah. Isaiah 45 verse 1, that Cyrus, king of Persia, is about to conquer Babylon. He will release the Jews to come back. Shout for joy. Expand your tents when you get back. Your city of Jerusalem will expand like a tent has to be expanded. The pegs go out and more people are coming. You will expand so much that the cities that are desolate will be inhabited by your children. So, oh man, what a promise. By the way, King Nebuchadnezzar destroyed more than Jerusalem. He destroyed all the fortress cities of Judah. In 586. Here we go, verse 4. Fear not, for you will not be put to shame. Do not be humiliated, for you will not be disgraced. But you will forget the shame of your youth and the reproach of your widowhood. You will remember no more. What is the reproach of widowhood? They lost their husband. Who was their husband? Yahweh. Because of their idolatry, they lost Yahweh. He drives them into Babylon. It is the shame of their youth. It's idolatry. Now, he's saying, you'll not remember it anymore. Why? Look at verse 5. For your husband is your maker, whose name is Yahweh of hosts. Your Redeemer is the Holy One of Israel, who is called the God of all the earth. Verse 6. For Yahweh has called you like a wife forsaken and grieved in spirit, even like a wife of one's youth when she is rejected, says your God. In other words, what he's saying is, I rejected you because you're of your idolatry. But now I'm calling you. But I'm doing it, listen to this now, myself. I'm suffering for you. Verse 7, for a brief moment I forsook you. But with great compassion, I will gather you. For a brief moment, I forsook you. What's that moment? It's Babylonian captivity. There. But I, I will now gather you back at Zion. By the way, when I say you're going to be punished, the question is how? You're either going to be punished by being forsaken by God yourself, or... You will be in Zion wed to Christ. And He will have been forsaken for you. My Father, my Father, Elo, Elo, Lama Sabachthana, why have you forsaken me? I'll give the answer to that rhetorical question. Christ was forsaken on the cross by the Father for Hazel, for Rochelle, for Sue, for Catherine. For Jan, for everyone in this room. 
And now, all the promises of Yahweh are yours because of Him. Verse 8. In an outburst of anger, I hid my face from you for a moment. That's the cross. That's Babylon. But with everlasting loving kindness, I will have compassion on you, says Yahweh, your Redeemer. In other words, Bill, Babylon, for a moment, in anger, he hid his face. It's the same words used of the cross. It's incredible. Babylon has got to be the most extraordinary picture of the cross of Jesus Christ that there is. Verse 9, For this is like the days of Noah to me, when I swore that the waters of Noah would not flood the earth again. Look at this now, Gene Bundy. So I have sworn that I will not be angry with you. Star that, underline that. Let me say that again. That is verse 9. I have sworn that I will not be angry with you, nor will I rebuke you. Why? Why? Because the punishment has been given. And so any Christian who says, God is angry with me, God is rebuking me, does not understand the suffering servant motif. Christ bore your Babylon. And God is never angry with you, nor does He rebuke you. And so, Catherine, this comes back to, could it be then that there are natural consequences to our sins as believers? Of course. But it's not the rebuke or anger of God at all for Christians, for those in Christ. But for a person who says, well, God loves everybody and, 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 and so on, I'm like, no, 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 He punishes sinners. You have a choice. You'll either, He's angry with the wicked. You either feel His anger yourself or you trust the suffering servant felt it for you. You see the gospel here, Rochelle? All right, let's go on. Verse 10. For the mountains may be removed and the hills may shake, but my loving kindness will not be removed from you, and my covenant of peace will not be shaken, says Yahweh, who has compassion on you. Bill, there it is. It's my covenant of peace. Okay, this is Babylon, but it's the cross. We have just talked about the cross in Isaiah 53. But the Jews experienced it in Babylon. And now he's saying, what? You've experienced it in Babylon? I am now forever in my covenant of peace, taking it for you. Verse 11. O afflicted one, storm-tossed and not comforted, behold, I will set your stones in antimony, and your foundations I will lay in sapphires. Uh, moreover, I will make your battlements of rubies, your gates of crystal, your entire wall of precious stones. Now, I'll come back and explain the jewels in just a moment, but watch. Verse 13, all your sons will be taught of Yahweh, and the well-being of your sons will be great. In righteousness, you will be established. You will be far from oppression, for you will not fear, and from terror, for it will not come near you. If anyone fiercely assails you, it will not be from me. Can, can I say that again? If anyone fiercely assails you, it will not be from me. Whoever assails you will fall because of you. You're mine. Behold, I myself have created the smith who blows the fire of coals and brings out a weapon for its work. And I have created the destroyer to ruin. I have created the destroyer to ruin. But look at this now, verse 17, the most powerful verse you'll ever read. No weapon that is formed against you will prosper. Every tongue that accuses you in judgment, you will condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of Yahweh, and their vindication is from me, declares Yahweh. In other words, when you come to faith in Christ, the riches of the promises of God for you are off the charts. You are wed to Christ. You are His people. 
And there's no weapon formed, including the one that Yahweh forms, the destroyer to ruin, death, that will ever prosper against you because the suffering servant has bore your chastisement. So, let's do this very quickly. Turn over to Galatians 3. Here's the application because Paul in Galatians 3 quotes Isaiah 54. I'm going to read this very briefly and then we'll close with about four minutes of questions. In Galatians chapter 4, or 3, excuse me, Paul, I have a subtitle. Faith brings righteousness. Look at verse 6. Abraham believed God. It was credited to him for righteousness. Therefore, be sure, it is those who are of faith, of faith, who are the sons of Abraham. This is why in Genesis it says, God making a covenant with Abraham, that's verse 8, all the nations will be blessed in you. So then those who are of faith are blessed with Abraham, the believer. Look at verse 10. For as many are of the works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law to perform them. No one is justified by the law before God. For the righteous man shall live by faith. Faith in what? Faith in the suffering servant who bore our punishment. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. Or we can say it like this. Christ redeemed us from the punishment of our unfaithfulness by going to Babylon in our stead. For it is written, Curse is everyone who hangs on a tree in order that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we would receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. And then he goes on to compare two mountains. We won't, don't have time. But the law and grace and works and faith. And he says to everyone who will read him very clearly, all of your blessings are in Christ. Faith it. Don't work for it. Make sense? Let's open it up. Four minutes for questions before we go. Or comments. comments. And does it make sense? Yes. Uh, okay, good. Good. Rochelle, thoughts? Such a beautiful... Yeah. I mean, it, it really is so beautiful. Yeah, and... You know, let me tell you what. You're free. Are you free? Yeah. So free. Here's the deal. When people come out and say, God loves everybody and God is grace and he would never condemn anybody. And so that, that's empty. That is just flat empty. There's no meaning in that. But when you can say, whoa, 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 whoa. God is righteous. He punishes the wicked. He takes no pleasure in it. But here's the good news. He's also chosen to take the punishment himself for those who will believe. And if you trust him, if you, if you unite yourself with Christ, you go to Jerusalem and say, I'm yours. All the promises of God are yes and amen. Even if you screw up in life, no matter how many times, why? Because all the punishment do your screw-ups. Christ bore. Faith it. Live it. So I struggle with modern day preaching that that says um, it's about your commitment. How can you be more committed? Yep. Your commitment will unlock fully devoted. What more blessings and all that stuff. And that's I just feel that yoke, I feel a heavy yoke that goes down around my shoulders. Yep, yep, me too. With that kind of teaching. It's not and the gospel. it's so opposite 
of this, and yet we're so easily pulled into that kind of teaching. And let me tell you why, to Rochelle. where we feel like we got to be better, no, do better, work harder. Let me tell you, be more work, committed. Work. Be, <laughs> yes, be fully devoted. Recommit, repent, all, all of this. And let me tell you why. Why do we run back to that I, when this? I'll tell you is why. Life. Are you ready? Yes. It's much easier to say I'll do something. Then it is to get up at 7 o'clock and come to a Bible study for myself. <laughs> I'm just telling you the truth. The reason people don't believe this is because they don't know it. All they know is a little piece. But they don't know the message. And therefore, they stand up and basically it's all about what you do and what you commit and being fully devoted disciples so that God will bless you more. And I'm like, Come on, guys, that's a bunch of crap. He died in our place. Now all the promises of God are ours. Faith it. It, all, it, it robs him of his glory yeah. for us to yeah. follow a theology that says commit more, be more yeah. selfless, yeah, be more giving, be absolutely. more. It robs him of his glory. glory. Yeah. And, and by the way, the people who understand grace, Rochelle, like you, I find to be the most loving, the most giving, the most generous, the most freeing in relationships, the most accepting. Now, sometimes people get confused by me because they hear the language of a prophet to a nation about punishment coming, about famine, pestilence, war, sudden death. And they're like, wait a minute, I thought you are a person of grace. <laughs> and my response is, I am. But it's only in Christ. And if you're not in Christ, the punishment is coming. You will be destroyed. You will be destroyed. They just don't understand that to be in Christ doesn't mean you're expecting them to clean up or change. Uh, absolutely. They, they don't think, understand They that. think that's what's being asked of them. No, no, no. I'm asking them yeah. to learn of Christ. Right. To grow in your knowledge. Outside, that's the narrative. No, uh, that's the narrative. That is given. Because they listen to the typical Baptist right. church. Right. So if a guy comes to me, he's a transgender, homosexual, whatever you call him. I will love him, pay for his dinner, talk about Christ, and not even tell him to change. But the Spirit of God, the more he gets to know Christ, things will happen in him that he doesn't even understand. The, the, this, it's the Spirit's work. The whole problem with our culture is they have no identity. They don't know who they are. I'm trying to tell you who you are in Christ. And when you know that, listen now, you don't care if you're fat, old, young, you don't care if you're rich, poor, beaten, praised. You can be silent because you know in Christ no weapon that is formed can come against you. So you can just be quiet. You can be happy, joyful, full of joy, even when you're taken to court multiple times for stupid things. It's okay. I think that this shows us that the road to the cross is so much further back than we were originally taught. Wow. Oh, good point, Sue. Yeah. Good point. Yeah. Good point. I think, Bill and I, we're just doing backflips back here. I think people came to faith in Yahweh in Babylon. Even though, even though there's some texts, and Tim and I have talked about this, there are some texts, Paul gives texts, where he says, the, the fully applicable understanding of grace is in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, which was an event that occurred. However, you could believe in the suffering servant before the event because he's telling us, past tense, I'm bearing your punishment. You're going back and prospering because your trust is in me. I promise you in the covenant of peace, I will never be angry with you again. I will never rebuke you, which leads me, Gene, we'll close with this, to your great question a couple of weeks ago. You said, well, now wait a minute. In AD 70, the same thing happened. Jerusalem was destroyed. 
Bill and I have a response to that. They were not believers in Yahweh, Yeshua. They were not his people. His people fled to the hills. In fact, uh, I think it was uh, Eusebius, the historian, who said not one follower of Jesus Christ was killed in AD 70. These were religious zealots for the Jewish religion that the Romans killed. And the leaders of the religion, the Jewish leaders, Berenice, the great granddaughter of uh, Herod the Great, she was the mistress for Titus, God the Son, Caesar of Rome, his dad, Vespasian, was God the Father. But Berenice was his mistress. These were wicked people. And they're the ones who died. But Gene, your great question is that there is no anger of God for those who trust the suffering servant. I see your mind spinning. Those people that believe we're done with this. Go ahead. The people that believe uh, in Babylon ah. looking forward to Jesus. Bingo. Did they feel the forgiveness? The, okay. Oh Gene. We're going to pick up again. We feel forgiveness. Do we, we don't ask for forgiveness. Uh, correct. Because you are forgiven. Mm -hmm. Okay, now watch this though. People, I, I got Your traditional Baptists get really upset with me when I say, you don't have to ask God for, to forgive you. You're already forgiven. And, and they get really upset. And they say, no, 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 no. Listen. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass. It's right there. I'm like, oh, you're misunderstanding. That's a statement of characterization, not a request. In other words, Lord, as free as I am with other people, you are free with me. By the way, one of the ways you know you're not forgiven is you don't forgive others. But the person who's forgiven forgives that is a statement of characterization of his people so what do we do if we confess our sins homo legeo we say the same things about our sins that god says about them he is faithful and just having forgiven us our sins what does that mean when i sin and that's a lot it's a lot i say of my sin Oh, Father, thank you for your love and forgiveness. Thank you that you say of that sin, Christ bore the punishment for it. I praise you for that. Now, I know that my sin will cause me problems, but there's no anger from you. Thank you for that. I am homo legeoing, saying the same thing, homo saying, legeo, to speak, the same thing he's saying of my sin. Guys, that is so Freeing. By the way, you overcome addiction when you're taught that. The people who don't overcome addiction are those who always think they have to earn the favor of God. Man, we've gone over time. God bless you guys. Thank you all for watching. Next week, let's do this. We're going we're gonna to finish up 55. It's all one point. So we may do a brief review of 54 and 55, but we will finish Deutero, Isaiah, and then we will launch into the third and final portion of Isaiah. Thank you all for watching. We'll see you next Friday. What would you say?